So when we are researching a concept then, because our practice really does develop out of our examination of curatorial theory as well as artistic practice, as we are thinking about various exhibits that we want to mount, that we're observing what has been done before by other curators, other museums, other institutions, and we're thinking about ideas that we want to present in our own manner, in our own style, for exhibitions and other types of public art or public works projects. And your inspiration could come from a particular artist's work. So there may be, you might want to do just a show on uh, an artist who you think is up and coming or one who's already well established. It may even be a retrospective. You may be looking at a trend or a phenomenon in art making, such as uh, uh, there, there, there's a whole new, because it's related to new media, there's a whole new genre of art that's publicly created where people are, inter are li linked to each other on the web and they're creating art on the web as collaborative processes. Or it may come out of growing interests that you have in various types of issues, whether they're cultural issues, social issues, political, environmental, or historic, as are being reflected in the art that artists are producing. Or it might be just one of those things where you wake up in the middle of the night and there is this epiphany What if I was to do an installation of, have you ever seen those, um, you mount them on a wall and they're motion activated and it's a fish and then as soon as you walk by it, the fish looks out at you and starts singing. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Those dudes was fast as lightning and there's a fish singing to you. Did you ever see those things? You get this idea. I'm gonna mount a whole wall of them so that when I walk by, there, it's like a wave, all right? This wave of sound of everybody singing kung fu fighting, all these fish heads singing. All right? And what I've done, I mean, that's, I mean, that's trash, but I've taken trash and I've turned it into performance. Of course, it'll be battery operated too, so that'd be something I need to think about, but it could be something as, uh, yeah, as these kinds of epiphanies, dang. I don't want any of you to use that idea either. So we're gonna talk about theory now and theory building. Because theory is seen as often this abstract thing and it's often used in the wrong way too. You know, like I have a theory as to why Fadden was in a particularly good mood today. No, that's not a theory, that's an opinion. That's a supposition. Theory building is actually the observations that we make that contribute to knowledge, but also allow us in many ways to predict, explain, and even affect events that are happening or understand why things have happened. So some of these central issues are understanding the nature of theory and theory building, that we have the ability not only to construct but revise theory and be able to apply knowledge from theory in a practical way, there is curatorial theory. By knowing theory, we become more than just people running on automatic pilot. We understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it works, or if it didn't, why it didn't work. So theory defined, at its base, it's a systematic way of pulling a multitude of facts together in such a way we can comprehend them all at once. That we build theory by observing events. Now, once something is accepted as theory, it means that enough people have made enough observations to say, yes, this is true. So theories are either, uh, they're either negated or they're reinforced. Once they are reinforced, they're accepted as true. So when someone says, oh, that's just a theory, it's another misuse of the term when we're looking at it in um, the social as well as the hard sciences. 
because what we're looking at is the way that we construct knowledge. Because what it also allows us to do, not only are we pulling all of this information together, that we're actually, based on our observations, able to make pretty precise predictions that could be termed scientific. So based on what we've observed, we understand that if this happens, we can expect this to happen. Now, in a real base way, where we're talking about these, these types of predictions, I'll, I'll give a real quick example of how we are lay theorists. I mentioned uh, on the first day of class how many came to school to be unemployed. When you leave, you're actually operating on observations that have been repeated to you, that are accepted to be true. And correlations, correlations mean things that occur together. They are either positive correlations, negative correlations, or no correlation. In other words, there's no connection between the events. The assumption that you operated on when you pay your tuition is that by spending this money now, we'll call this a positive correlation. I plan to increase my earning or job opportunity. Increase one, you increase the other. That's a positive correlation. You may be doing an educational program that will be a negative correlation. In other words, by increasing one variable, we'll say education about using condoms or teaching about birth control in a, uh, in a high school, but by teaching about condom use that you'll expect a decrease in the transfer of, of sexually transmitted disease, or by teaching birth control, a, a decrease in teen pregnancies. That is increasing education, decreasing the incidence of another. And if for some reason you engage in this important program on educating teens, and all of a sudden you've got twice the number of pregnant youngsters in your school. Whoa, wait a second, that wasn't supposed to happen. Then you have to go back and look at why did this occur. The same way if you are looking at uh, advertising for a particular exhibit that's going to come out you're gonna research what strategies have worked and hope that based worked in one community or in one museum, the same strategy will work in the museum where you are. So it's important to be engaged in this theory building process. So we construct it by making observations. Man, this thing's on quaaludes today. So you observe a phenomenon or phenomena, plural. You observe an event or events. You witness repeated patterns. How do things occur together? Does increasing the incidence of one action cause something else to increase? Or by decreasing something, does something else decrease or increase? So we look for patterns in our observations. Does spending money on newspaper advertisements increase museum visitation? Or should we spend money on radio? Should we spend money on web marketing and social marketing? We develop an explanation of how the variables or the events relate to each other. And then we try to predict. And then based on our observations and our predictions, we adjust our behavior not only in the present, but how we may do things in the future. So theory is pretty important. Curatorial theory is very important. It helps us understand what's going on in the curatorial and the museum world. And then ultimately, when you're reading the various journals, someone is communicating the outcomes of what they've done. And as a curator, you do the same thing. And then what you do contributes to the overall understanding of curatorial theory. 
And this is really important, particularly because indigenous curatorial theory is different than the curatorial theory of the West. You're operating under different spiritual as well as cultural and even economic parameters. So there is a distinct difference. So it's important to look at, that's why one of the texts we use, well, the, the main text to, you know, deals a lot with intercultural issues. There's another course uh, where Michelle uh, Magal is using a, a text that you just bought. That in particular is looking at Canada. But in, in Canadian curatorial theory is somewhat different with indigenous peoples or so-called First Nations than in the United States, preserving what is valued. And then we are constantly revising and revisiting. 